You know, the recommendation that was made back in 1951 said that instead of saving money and bringing about more efficient operations, the cost for money for the post office and, and the amount of bureaucracy that would be there, that would have little districts out there where we'd have just all different types of postmaster generals. You know, what we're asking for, Mr. Chairman, is that the future of the Postal Service is in the hands of this committee in H.R. 22 is the only means right now for the salvation that we could get. And Mr. Chairman, I do apologize. I, I am from the South, so I talk a little slow. You, you talk you. just fine. Just fine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Mapper. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chavitz, members of the subcommittee, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, with your permission, I would like to briefly summarize my testimony and ask that my full statement be accepted and entered into the record. Without objection. My name is Charlie Mappa, and I'm president of the National League of Postmasters, and we've been representing postmasters since the late 1800s, and I'm pleased to appear here before you today. Thank you for inviting all of us to testify. Before summarizing my statement, I would like to congratulate Chairman Lynch on being named chairman of this subcommittee. It is comforting to the League that, to know that the chair comes with a very strong postal background. In my written testimony, I addressed three topics. Number one, the overall state of the Postal Service and the need to allow the Postal Service to refinance its obligation to fund our retirees' health benefits as H.R. 22 would do. Number two, the importance of small post offices to rural America and the minuscule amount of money that closing substantial numbers of them would save. Number three, the manner in which the Postal Service has controlled costs over the last several years, the diminishing returns of that re approach, and the means to better increase efficiency and reduce costs. Clearly, the nation is in extremely troubled times. The economy is at its lowest point since the Great Depression. The Postal Service is in trouble and needs relief. H.R. 22 would give some relief. The consequences of not acting are disastrous. There are 8.4 million postal-related jobs and more than $1 trillion in revenue attributed to the mailing industry. That, I believe, is even larger than the auto industry. If the mailing sector were to crash, it would shake the American economy to the core, and given its fragile condition, it could bring the entire economy to a standstill. That must be avoided at all costs. Let me also emphasize that relief must exist beyond two years. Anything else would create a system that will appear to be on the edge of disaster, held together by spit, glue, and rubber bands. That is exactly the image that will drive mailers to aggressively seek alternatives to the Postal Service, electronic and otherwise, that will result in a loss of volumes that otherwise should not have been lost and otherwise would not have been lost. H.R. 22 will save the Postal Service, and it will do so without spending a dime of the taxpayer's money. My written testimony goes into much greater detail about how H.R. 22 works. In terms of small post offices, when one comes to the world of postal and public policy concerns, one often assumes that many small offices could be closed, resulting in little harm and significant savings. Usually that point of view is predicated upon a misunderstanding of the role of the small post office in rural America and a mistaken belief that the cost of maintaining these post offices is much greater than it actually is. My testimony shows that small post offices are vital to the continued existence of rural America and that they truly bind rural America together. When a small rural post office closes in a rural community, often the community ends up becoming a ghost town. Mr. Chairman, closing small post offices saves no significant money. If one were to close the smallest 10,000 post offices, more than one-third of all post offices in the country, the savings to the Postal Service would be minimal, less than 1% of the Postal Service's budget. The bottom line is that if the Postal Service wants to close a small rural post office and the community doesn't care, so be it. But if the Postal Service wants to close a small roll post office and the community does care because it doesn't want to disappear, then the Postal Service shouldn't close that office. Finally, my testimony looks at the way the Postal Service has reduced costs over the last decade and argues that a better way to gain efficiency is to flatten the management structure 
and eliminate unnecessary bureaucracy. One way the Postal Service has saved cost is by reducing carrier and clerk hours and shifting these hours onto the postmaster for the postmaster to work instead of the clerk or carrier. Today, many postmasters are working 60 and 70 hours a week, some even more. Mr. Chairman, massive burnout is close. A disaster is looming on the horizon and I would be remiss in my duties if I did not make that perfectly clear. Finally, instead of becoming more efficient, we are becoming more and more bureaucratic. More telecons, more forms, more reports. It needs to stop. One way is to eliminate management layers. The Postal Service recently cut the number of districts down to 74. It needs to do more and reduce these down to something more like 40. The idea is not that cost savings come from the positions cut, but from the streamlining, streamlining and removal of layers of management, making decisions easier and cheaper to make, and easier and cheaper to implement. The thing to do in these challenging times is to flatten the bureaucracy and trust that postmasters will rise to meet the challenge. We would do that if the Postal Service would let us. Thank you for considering our views. Thank you. Mr. Keating? Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch. It's comforting to naps, as Charlie indicated, that uh, my Boston accent will not be a problem for this committee. <laughs> no, you will not need a translator with me. <laughs> the Postal Service continues to suffer from the steady erosion of mail volume. Last month, USPS reported that eighth consecutive quarter of lower mail volume, volume off more than 15 percent from where it was this time last year. Even greater losses are predicted through the remainder of this year. The last time mail volume fell by as much was in 1937, in the midst of the Depression. The Postal Service has not been passive in response to the worsening financial condition. Over the past year, as mail volume has continued to steadily decline, the Postal Service has initiated aggressive cost-cutting actions that have reduced the financial loss. The Postal Service has cut 50 million work hours, stopped construction of new post offices and facilities, instituted a nationwide hiring freeze, consolidated mail processing operations, and reduced hours in many post offices. Last Friday, it announced the closure of six of its 80 districts, the elimination of more than 1,400 mail processing supervisor and management positions at nearly 400 facilities around the country, and the offering of another early retirement opportunity to nearly 150,000 postal employees. These actions are expected to save the Postal Service more than $100 million annually, more job cuts are likely to come as downsizing continues, operations are streamlined, and processing and delivery networks are made more efficient. Indeed, much more remains to be done to restore the financial health of the Postal Service. Congress needs to do its part, Mr. Chairman. We urge the committee to move ahead and promptly report out H.R. 22. Even when H.R. 22 passes, however, we will not be out of the swamp. Additional steps will be necessary. Let me take a moment to comment on these additional steps the post office should take. First and foremost, the Postal Service needs to rethink its organizational structure and reorganize itself. Its nationwide management framework, currently built around 10 geographic areas, is far too large and bureaucratic and costly to be allowed to continue. The Postal Service should return to an organization structure based on five geographic regions. It is time that the Postal Service applies the same cost cut and scrutiny to the members of its executive ranks as it is applying to middle and lower management. Let me repeat that. It is time the Postal Service applies the same cost cut and scrutiny to its executive ranks as it applies to middle and lower management. Second, the Postal Service should promptly withdraw from the practice of buying homes of its employees, ostensibly in support of relocation needs. This policy has caused the Postal Service to rack up significant losses. The downsides of this policy are now becoming more and more evident. As the Postal Service faces an inventory of homes, it must continue to pay to maintain until it can sell them. Third, the Postal Service should stop tolerating the practice of detailing supervisors and managers to positions that don't officially exist in the organizational structure. Currently, there are hundreds of supervisors detailed to these ad hoc positions created at the discretion of district managers to address issues that personally concern them. It is unfortunate, Mr. Chairman, that I need to raise an internal management matter like this to your attention. It is only one of the numerous problems that NAPS and the postmaster organizations 
have raised with the Postal Service. Like so many of the recommendations, they have been ignored by top USPS management. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the Postal Service faces grave challenges brought about by the deep recession and aggregated further by continuing electronic diversion. These challenges, however, are not unquarkable. Through the initiatives I have touched upon, including the swift passage of H.R. 22, the finances of the Postal Service can eventually be stabilized. The Postal Supervisors look forward to working with you and the Congress to make sure that happens. Thank you for the consideration of my testimony. I look further to continuing the dialogue with you as time allows. Thank you. Uh, let me begin uh, by asking you know, each of you, in terms of the proposal by, by the post office presently to uh, reduce delivery days from six to five, uh, it seems from, from your own testimony that there's more uh, that can be gained from getting rid of some of the bureaucracy here and perhaps even consolidating some of the post offices in areas other than the rural areas. I understand the situation where the post office is the only game in town. It's, you know, it's, as, as, as Mr. Goff indicated uh, in, in New England, you've got post offices that operate as uh, a pharmacy, a bank, uh, and in a lot of a lot of small towns, you know the, the post office and the health center and you know a gas station that can that's pretty much your your hub uh, of some of these towns. But uh, in areas where you, you have a high density of of, of post offices, uh, have we have we leapt over that that uh, that phase instead and in, in are looking to cut uh, you know, cut a delivery day already. Are we going too quickly in this, in, in this uh, suggested solution, or should we, we be dropping back to look at some of these uh, ways of, of reducing costs? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I know the, the six to five day delivery thing. I can tell you as an organization, as the president of NAPIS, that I'm in totally against reducing down to five-day delivery. And I say that for several reasons. Coming from a, one of the largest cities and the operational side of this, just think of the holidays that we have now, the 10 or 12 that we have during the year. That day after the holiday, we're constantly making up for the day that we just missed. So if we had a savings on that one day of reducing down to five days, my idea is that we're going to just play holiday every time after that fifth day that we're going to catch up. So if there's a savings on that one day, we're going to lose it on that following day. Now, as far as the, the amount that would be saved from that, I'm not sure if the figures are all totally accurate that we've heard three or four different figures today on just what that savings would be. But from an operational side, how do we keep the mail flowing? We flow it now. Uh, you know, are the retail areas still going to work? Are the clerks still going to work to process mail? So, you know, I'm not sure that the big savings is there. And when you talk about the, the consolidation of, of the postal network or the stores that we, we have out there, I think there's some room that we can do it as far as stations within the big cities, the, the big urban areas. As you said, the rural areas, that cannot be done. That's, that's the lifeline of those communities. But I would think that we could look at some type of area there where we could take a station in downtown New York City and maybe put some consolidation there. Uh, you know, as you was said earlier, do we need to have one in every high-rise building? I don't think we do because the volume's not there anymore. You know, uh, I still say that even though, and you heard Mr. Mappa say that, that we went down to 74 districts, there's still a lot of room. Mr. Chairman, we have 50 states. We could go with 50 districts. Or better yet, we could eliminate all of the districts and just stay with our areas we have out there. As Mr. Davis said this morning about the, uh, the communication age that we're in now, and believe me, there's postmasters sitting in this room right now that will tell you that nobody, big brother's there. Big brother watches us on the computer all the time. They know everything that we're doing. 
So it's, I think that we can still streamline that way. And it's incumbent upon us, whether it's management or union or the, the upper executives in the Postal Service, that we have to work together to change this structure. Okay. Uh, my time is just about expired. I'd like to uh, give five minutes to the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Chaffetz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to further explore this idea of the uh, five-day delivery. I'd like to get the other gentleman's uh, input on that. And is there some sort of sliding scale where maybe uh, maybe it's not for every single week, but, you know, with 10 days a year? Is there somewhere in between that uh, you'd find acceptable? Uh, five-day delivery is, it, it sounds good on the outset, but then if you examine it like uh, Mr. Goff has done, uh, he's, he's there in the post office on, on a Tuesday after three days off. Uh, the mail accumulates. You're delivering Saturday, Sunday, and Monday mail, and, yep. and that holiday mail. So if, if we're going to take, uh, take another delivery day out of the week, then that means you're going to every week be delivering three days of mail on let's say a Monday, and it's it's a it's a real challenge. Your carriers have got to carry a lot more mail. Uh, you've got a lot more mail to put in the boxes. You have up times that you you're punished for if you don't make it in time for that. So that's that's one aspect that we have to examine. The other aspect is, even though they say that 85 percent of Americans don't care if we deliver mail to them on on Saturday, what about the 15 percent that do? Who are those 15 percent? Are those the businesses out there that actually pay a lot of money into the, the postal system that help keep us going? Uh, I don't think we need to be too cavalier when we decide that we want to, or that when we say we want to go to five-day delivery. I think there are a lot of aspects that we really have to examine but before do you have we any jump other on that. Do you have other suggestions? If I mean, I don't think anybody necessarily wants to do this. The question is, what are we going to have to do, and and what's most palatable, what's not not so. I think so. In its in its place, I guess the challenge to all three of you is, in its place, what other options are there to come up with literally a couple billion dollars? A couple of billion dollars that I, you know, before we came here today, we did not sit down and compare notes about what kind of uh, des testimony we would do. But I saw in all three of our testimonies, we called to attention the immense bureaucracy in the Postal Service and the, the need to reduce that. Uh, I know that uh, Ted would love to have his supervisors be able to supervise. Dale and I would love to have our postmasters be able to run their post offices. Uh, we are responsible people. We've been trained to manage. If you gave us half a chance, I, I think the uh, Postal Service would be surprised, but we're so into uh, micromanaging uh, that every breath. I, I, I just think it's unhealthy the way we do things in the Postal Service. Okay. And Thanks. I want to give a little time to Mr. Keating. Sure. I, I too have previously testified against the five-day delivery. I think that it would be the beginning of the end of the Postal Service as we know it as a, as a service to the American people. And I, I think that uh, the layers of management are one thing, but there was a lot of, you know, the Postal Service came to us last year the three organizations, or probably the unions too, and, and asked for givebacks because of the financial situation. And, and we thought about it, and in the end, we, we eventually said no, because we see daily the waste that goes on in the Postal Service. We give them ideas about how they can save money, and they totally ignore it. So until we see Postal Headquarters addressing some of the issues that we've given to them, you know, we're not going to be thinking about giving givebacks to the Postal Service. There are a lot of things we can do internally still to get the Postal Service back in shape, and I believe we can do that. Uh, Mr. Goff? I agree with uh, Mr. Keating. That was my thought when, when you asked that, that, you know, that question. You know, there's so many things that we have brought forward, and just to be told no, that we're not going to do that. You know, we heard several times today that you're consulting with the management associations on some issues. And, we, and I think you saw me a couple of times just go like that, and I'm going, well, I don't remember talking about that. Maybe they're going to consult with us in the future on it. But the, there's some issues that we have brought forward, the details that are out there, the money we spend on people uh, per diem, staying in hotels as they work on the details somewhere. And in some of these districts, and I can speak back for home, that you, know, you may have 15, 20, 30, 50 people working on details. There's cost involved there. We've got other areas we can tighten up with. 
I, I guess one of the challenges that I would ask you all, long term and short term as well, to work towards and to, to think about that I would be particularly interested in seeing is, you know, the, the idea of consolidating uh, distribution facilities, post offices. I, I think there's a distinct difference between a rural post office, which could be the center of town. I could think of several in my district. I have a very urban component. I have a very rural component. I think of Oak City. Oak City in my district is a very, very small town, but the post office is the center of town. It's where people gather. They do a lot more than just pick up the mail. I think it's a very different equation than how you deal with maybe an urban center or downtown where there may be post offices that are literally two or three blocks apart from each other. How to tackle that issue, I think, is something that needs to be addressed long term. And my time is, 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 is is out now the light is red but maybe we can explore this more in the future but thank you both thank you all three of you for being here thanks mr chairman thank you also i would like to point out that we're going through a process right now about how to deal how to deal with the instability in the postal service right now now we do have your testimony uh some of these uh parts of solutions are are loosely developed and others are, are, are more detailed, such as HR 22. But we would want to hear from you. I, I think it's very important that the postmasters, folks that are on the front lines and trying to manage uh, this system, have an opportunity to contribute to the solution. I think that's a very important piece here. So just as the chair of the committee, and I'm sure I speak for the other members on both sides, we welcome your input. Uh, you know, I think you've you've pointed out some things that we haven't heard from the other panels, and uh, you know, I, I think they're well founded. L let me ask you, uh, Mr. Goff, you you also mentioned in your testimony uh, about the possible uh, projected overpayment by by the United States Postal Service into the Civil Service Retirement Trust Fund and the fact that OPM could go back and more accurately calculate that. Uh, that's something that interests me because this HR 22 issue and how, how, we, how we solve that or, or provide some relief to that funding requirement is a very important piece here. Everybody's talked about that. And if we don't have accurate numbers in terms of what, what is required in the first place, uh, we, we need to have a solid base that we're operating from. I need that number to be as hard as possible, the number that we need and the amount of relief, obviously, that, that is required. So uh, could you, you know, just expand on that a little bit, amplify that point? Uh, just as we've been talking, we're, we're trying to look at ways that we can go back in and help the Postal Service, just as you were saying, too. We feel under the, the previous administration that when we got this situation taken care of, is that the figure that came about, that, you know, it, it was one that was okay for everybody. Yes, we were overpaying, but we still feel, after looking at it for a while now, that the, the overpayments, we're still overpaying into that fund. And yeah. I think that needs to be looked at. It's just another area that we think that we can go in and find some additional funds that the Postal Service would have. Okay. Uh, just so you know, I've asked my staff, uh, committee staff, to... Uh, to send a letter to uh, John John Berry, who's the new director of OPM, ask him to to give me a good hard number. Look at these numbers again, and and obviously in this environment we can't have the Postal Service overpaying. Uh, and then we've got to figure out a way to provide some relief there that doesn't put the whole uh, health benefit system in jeopardy. So. We're, we're trying to we're trying to find a way forward here on on that point, you know, much as HR 22 has suggested. But I want to have, you know, you, you sort of you, you need to have the right numbers to work from before you throw a projection out there. Otherwise, we're uh, you know we're acting on on bad information. We can't have that because there's so much at risk here. But uh, just so you know, I. I understand what you said, and we're going to try to get a better number on that going forward. Uh, let's see. Okay. Well, we appreciate you, you coming before us. We appreciate the uh, 
testimony that you, you've rendered here, uh, this, is a on, this is an ongoing process. So we want you to be involved here. We think you have a lot, of, a lot that you can contribute in your years of service and your perspective. And uh, you are welcome partners in this. I just want you to know that. And uh, you know, your, your, your insight has been valu very valuable to the, to the committee. Thank you very much. We have the final panel. Hey there.
Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, it is the committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. May I ask you to rise, please, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that the witnesses have responded in the affirmative. I will uh, give a brief introduction and then we'll, we'll have your, your testimony. Uh, Mr. William Burris, President of the American Postal Workers Union, AFL-CIO, uh, represents the largest single bargaining unit in the United States, which consists of more than 330,000 clerk, maintenance, and motor vehicle employees working in 38,000 facilities in the United States Postal Service. Uh, Mr. William Young, who is president of the National Association of Letter Carriers, is the 17th president of that association. Its 300,000 member union represents uh, city letter carriers employed in the United States Postal Service. Mr. John Hegarty uh, is, with, is president of the National Postal Mail Handlers Union. Uh, Mr. Hegarty was sworn into office as National Postal Mail Handlers Union president effective July 1, 2002. For the 10 years prior to becoming the national president, Mr. Hegarty served as president of Local 301 in New England, the second largest local union affiliated with the Mail Handlers Union. Mr. Don Cantrill is president of the National Rural Letter Carriers Association. He began his postal career in Bland, Missouri, where he was a member of the National Rural Letter Carriers Association. And Mr. Cantrill has served at all levels of the association, beginning with the president of his local unit. Uh, welcome, gentlemen, and uh, if I could, I would invite uh, Mr. Burris for his opening statement. I think I'm on. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for convening this hearing on the financial stability of the United States Post Service and for providing me the opportunity to testify on behalf of the dedicated employees that our union represents. I commend the committee through your leadership, Mr. Chairman, for convening today's hearing on this critical topic at a pivotal time in the history of the United States Postal Service. Mr. Chairman, I will summarize my remarks, but I ask that the complete written testimony be admitted into the record. It's been a long day, and I'll try to be as brief as I can. The nation and the world are experiencing a financial collapse that is unparalleled in modern history, and the Postal Service, like most institutions in our society, has been ad adversely affected. Mail volume has declined, leading to deficits that threaten the very foundation of the Postal Service. The Postal Service can take steps on its own to respond to the crisis, but Congress must also play its part. The most important thing that Congress can do is to pass H.R. 22 which will provide temporary relief from the crippling obligation to prefund future retiree health care costs. Absent this relief, it is unlikely that the Post Service can survive in its present form. Over the past 10 years, as the mailing industry engaged in debate over postal reform, the overriding focus was the impact of email, the internet, and the cost burden associated with serving an additional 1.8 million delivery addresses each year. With all the emphasis on a new form of communications, there was no focus on the real driving factor of hard copy communications, the economy. And as the country slid towards the recession that now engulfs us, no attention was paid to declining mail volume due to economic stagnation. Advocates of postal reform ignored the burden that prefunding retiree health care liabilities would pose on a service that would soon suffer double-digit volume reductions as a result of the nation's economic decline. The postal community identified the wrong threats and was totally unprepared for the challenges we now face. Emails, the internet, and other forms of instant communications are viewed as direct challenges to hard copying communications. But we have known about them for years, and looking backward is of little value when we need a vision for the future. The numbers speak for themselves. 
Annual deficits are expected far into the future. Yet the only solutions postal management has offered are reductions in work hours, consolidation of facilities, and five-day delivery. It is expected at some point management will suggest modifications to employees' wages and benefits in order to stem the tide of red ink. But I defer, I defer to that time any public comment on that possibility. I would like to inform Congress that of the groups representing posted employees, the crafts represented by the APW have been reduced disproportionately, 110,000 employees over a 10-year period. We would expect that reductions and other sacrifices will be shared equally among the entire postal community. But no business can exist for long with a strategy based on cost reduction alone. Eventually, it will become impossible to maintain an acceptable level of service, and there will be nothing left to cut. However, there are steps management can initiate to address the issue of financial stability. They could begin with a fundamental shift in the relationship between the Postal Service and commercial mailers. And I quote an observation by Joy Leung, a contributor to the newsletter Mailing Systems Technology, and I quote, Mailers are customers of the Postal Service, not shareholders. Printers, mail fulfillment services, and other vendors are contractors of the Postal Service, not shareholders. In recent years, these lines have been blurred, and major mailers have assumed the role of shareholders. They have formed organizations that have, that have been granted unfettered access to the inner working of the Postal Service, and to the decision-making process. One umbrella organization has even been afforded office space in postal headquarters. This cozy relationship between postal executives and major business mailers is unhealthy and counterproductive. One of the byproducts of this relationship is the preservation of work share, di di of work share discounts that benefit the mailers at the expense of postal service stability. I have repeatedly shared with the members of Congress the views of my union on excessive work share discounts and their corrosive effect on postal finances. Because over time, work share discounts have morphed into a disgraceful policy that rewards large mailers with rate reductions so extreme as to be absurd. Yes. Um, let me make this one point, Mr. Chairman. After investing $20 billion in automation to de design to affix barcodes on handwritten and other non-barcoded mail, the Post Service has converted a one cent per piece cost into what amounts to a 10.5 cent bonus to work shares. Uh, this practice policy and rate making process is detrimental to the health of the United States Post Service. But I have sung this song before, Mr. Chairman. Throughout the debate on postal reform, I have said that postal management has chosen a path that would lead to insolvency. And let me close with this, Mr. Chairman. The USPS current predicament is the result of a flawed business strategy and a lack of vision of how hard copy communications can be relevant into the future. Management has failed to find a meaningful role for the world's best delivery force, a system that reaches every American home six days per week, has a network of 40,000 facilities, enjoys stellar name recognition, and boasts a dedicated workforce. Until the posters finds a way to morph that proud tradition and workforce into a meaningful role far into the future of the nation's communication systems, uh, even with H.R. 22, the post service will not be long for the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, President Boris. Uh, President Young. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch and, and uh, Ranking Member Chavez. My written submission describes in some detail how and why we've come to this critical point in history of this extraordinary institution. It provides background on the retiree health issue, 
its funding, and it outlines specific recommendations, primary among them is H.R. 22. I'm pleased to note that nine of the 11 members of the subcommittee are now co-sponsors. You join the 208 other co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. That's very encouraging to all of us here. When the American public react with outrage and disgust at the travesty of AIG, and when they fume about bailouts for banks, brokers, and insurance companies that often reward wheeler dealers who got us into this unprecedented financial mess, you listen and you act, and you should. But I hope the innocent victims of this greed, the corruption and incompetence of Wall Street, don't get lost in the midst of all this anger. And believe me, my members are angry too. The financial elite of this country, aided and abetted by misguided deregulation, have trashed our economy, and the historic recession we face threatens the jobs and well-beings of 700,000 postal families across the country. Nothing we did, nothing the Postal Service did, and nothing the postal industry did caused this crisis. So we hope that Congress will listen and act to help us overcome it. I want you to know that all of us are doing everything that we can do. The Postmaster General outlined that in his testimony. I won't repeat it here. I'd, I'd suggest to you that letter carriers know a little something about helping out in a crisis, about steadiness when there is panic in the air, about sharing and about sacrifice. When anthrax appeared in the mail stream, the chances of public panic were significant. Letter carriers didn't panic. They continued to do their jobs in a very frightening environment. There was no public panic, and eventually things returned to normalcy. When Katrina devastated the Gulf Coast, many letter carriers lost their homes and all of their possessions. It was not until letter carriers appeared on the streets of New Orleans that the public panic began to subside and that normalcy returned. When officials from the Homeland Security Department needed a way to distribute vaccinations in our country if it came under a biological attack, the nation's letter carriers stepped up to the plate and volunteered to make those distributions under the City Readiness Initiative. Every year we volunteer our services. We conduct the nation's largest food drive on the second Saturday of May we replenish all the local food banks across America, delivering over 70 million pounds of food. We do these things because we accept our role in society. We are the men and women trusted by America to deliver their mail. We come to you now because the Postal Service is in trouble and we need your help. We contend that before you consider any drastic and counterproductive measures, such as the move to five-day delivery or redefining universal service, Congress can and should take several other steps to strengthen the Postal Service, starting with the passage of H.R. 22. I outlined those other things, by the way, in my testimony, and I won't bore you with it here this afternoon. With all due respect to Chairman Gallagher and Postmaster General Potter, this is not the time to undercut public and mailer respect for and reliance on the Postal Service by reducing Postal Services drastically and counterproductively to five days a week. The nation's mailers have diverse needs and businesses conducted six days a week in America. In general, they want six-day delivery, need six-day delivery, and expect six-day delivery. If the Postal Service doesn't provide it, someone else will demand the right to do it, and that will only add to the woes of the Postal Service. Now, we're here not to ask for a bailout. We're simply asking to use money that we've already put aside, our own money, the Postal Service's own money to get us through this crisis. Now, I'm not going to get into a debate with you all about scoring rules, which we all know can mean what we want them to mean when it suits our political purposes. But I'm confident that the same American public that is quite sure something is very wrong about bailing out AIG believes very strongly that something is right about the Postal Service. They may not appreciate AIG traders scurrying off with multi-million dollar bonuses using taxpayer hard-earned dollars, but they do appreciate their letter carrier earning his middle class salary, paying her taxes, raising their children in the community, and faithfully delivering their mail each day. And they will thank you for helping the Postal Service to use its own rainy day fund to do that, with a binding obligation to restore that rainy day fund when this crisis is passed. Not a bailout, not a subsidy, not a loan, our own money. How do you score that? Well, I'll tell you how I scored. I scored a home run for everyone, the Postal Service, postal employees, 
mailers, postal customers, and oh, by the way, the Congress of the United States. Before I conclude, I would like to address one further last issue. Earlier today, Chairman Lynch, you said that your concern about H.R. 22 was what it would leave a $75 billion unfunded liability in 2016 for future retiree health benefits. First, I share your concern. These benefits are my members' benefits, and I would never support legislation that would endanger their payment. Second, you should note, sir, that the $75 billion estimate is highly uncertain, if not suspect. It assumes that retiree premiums, retiree health benefit premiums will increase 7% a year forever. If there's anybody in this country that can survive that, I'd like to know who it is. 7% a year, every single year, forever. I'm going to submit a report from Watson Wyatt that shows that Medicare and Medicaid don't even believe that. Their long, more realistic long-term trend rate is 5% annually. That ought to be instructive for you all. Third, I'd like you to know, sir, that under H.R. 22, the balance in the retiree health fund will continue to grow from $32 billion today to $71.5 billion in 2016. Do you know how much the typical private sector company has pre-funded for its employees today? Zero. Do you know how much the Treasury, the Commerce, the Labor Departments have pre-funded? Zero. Do you know how much the Congress of the United States has pre-funded for you and your employees? Zero. So please let's not kill the Postal Service out of an understandable yet tenuous concern about unfunded liabilities in 2016. The reality is we need to re-examine the whole issue. I'm delighted to hear that you said that you were going to look into that, sir. The current funding schedule was set by the prior administration to meet short-term budget scoring rules. It wasn't set on the basis of any sound public policy or any sound accounting principles. In fact, and this is the part I think you'd be most interested in, sir, in fact, a fair accounting of the Postal Service. You really got to wrap up, sir. This uh, is it. No, I appreciate that you've been here all day, <laughs> okay. and, I'm, and I'm cutting you some slack, but uh, I, uh, I get, right. you, I get your I message. Can I finish one sentence? You, please do. Thank yeah. you. Please go in right In fact, ahead. a fair accounting of the Postal Service's surplus and Civil Service Retirement Fund, which the OPM calculated and the PAEA allocated to the Retiree Health Benefit Fund, would most likely offset any unfunded liability. Zero. Thank you, sir. No, I, I thank you. President Hegarty. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz. Uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to testify, and I'd ask that my entire written testimony be submitted for the record. Without objection. Uh, as with your predecessor, it's an honor to have someone as chair of the subcommittee who has such a rich background in labor and postal issues, Mr. Chairman. I wish to focus my comments today on what Congress and the executive branch can do, as well as what we, the Mail Handlers Union, are doing to help the Postal <coughs> Service through its current financial crisis. The first step is to simply enact H.R. 22. How often does Congress see a bill that would rectify a multi-billion dollar debt situation, keep a vital function of government alive, yet cost the taxpayer not one cent? That's what H.R. 22 does. How often are the Postal Service, the mailers, the unions, the management associations, and the $900 billion industry associated with the mail all on the same page. This is it, and it has bipartisan support. Aside from not costing the public a penny, H.R. 22 has the added benefit of continuing to increase the amount of money in the trust fund for future retirees' health care, and it does not reduce any health care benefits. Furthermore, it gives the Postal Service some flexibility for the foreseeable future and I fully support keeping the trust fund healthy. All of us at this table are in agreement. There is one aspect of this process, however, that I would like to address, the imposition of the CBO scoring on this bill. If CBO's score is an obstacle, then Congress needs to take a close look at the problem created by the rules under which CBO operates. The scoring issue may be singular to the Postal Service. It's a quasi-governmental agency which receives no federal appropriation for its operations. It's off-budget for some purposes and on-budget for others. Why should an intergovernmental transfer of U.S. Postal Service funds that in the long term will not change the finances of the Treasury by one cent and will not change the Postal Service's total obligation or the total amount of the Retiree Health Care Benefit Fund be construed as adding to the deficit? Why should a fix that does not cost the taxpayers or the users of the Postal Service one penny be scored? 
While it may make some sense in an academic accounting ledger world, it does not make common sense in the real world. If legislation similar to H.R. 22 is not passed, the Postal Service may not be able to meet all of its financial obligations as soon as September 30th of this year. And that inaction would add to a much bigger debt, the debt incurred by American society if we allow the Postal Service and the $900 billion industry which depends on it to fail. I obviously think Congress should figure out a way to pass H.R. 22. It is, in the words of President Obama's Reinvestment Act, temporary, targeted, and job saving. It is similar to the stimulus aid sent to the states to prevent layoffs and cuts in services, and I hope the subcommittee will look closely at this issue. I am often asked, what are we, the mail handlers union, doing to help the Postal Service cut costs? There's a complex story to be told here. First, during the past 10 years, thousands of mail handler jobs and more than 100,000 total postal jobs have been eliminated, mostly through attrition, while the mail continues to be processed and delivered professionally and on time. That is why postal employee productivity is at an all-time high. We have also aggressively pursued labor management programs to reduce overhead. Let me give you just a few examples. The ergonomic risk reduction process has succeeded in reducing repetitive motion injuries by as much as 35 percent because of the forceful backing of the Postmaster General and his headquarters staff, plant managers have embraced this effort. It has been estimated that the ergonomic risk reduction process saves on average 20 injuries per facility per year where the process is used, about a five-fold return on the dollar. These reductions account for approximately $77.8 million in cost avoidance. Then there is the Voluntary Protection Program, which is driven by employees and is OSHA-related. It looks at the cause of a specific, often traumatic injury and seeks to prevent a reoccurrence. There are measurable differences in the injury rates in facilities that use this program versus those that do not. So in our union developed a joint contract interpretation manual to encourage union and management representatives at all levels to resolve and reach consistent results on pending issues. It has saved many millions of dollars and added a level of predictability and responsibility to our craft. The parties also have a quality of working life program, which provides opportunities for mail handlers and supervisors working together to identify and resolve work problems in the workplace. The Postal Service reports that the savings are substantial in the millions of dollars. Finally, as a former labor leader, Mr. Chairman, you know how complicated a give and take process collective bargaining can be. Yet in our current contract, which was negotiated in 2006, ratified by our members and expires in 2011, we are reducing by 1% each year the amount the Postal Service pays toward our health care. The other unions and management associations are also on board with these reductions. The Postal Service's costs eventually will be reduced by more than $250 million per year when all unions and postal employees are taken into account. And in these five years alone, the Postal Service is saving over $800 million just from this one contract provision. So in my view, the unions have stepped up to the plate. We ask that Congress do the same by passing H.R. 22. Thank you for your time and attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, President Cantrell. Thank you, Chairman Lynch. Members of the subcommittee, I'd like to extend my thanks to the committee for scheduling a hearing on restoring the financial stability of the Postal Service. I would ask that my full testimony be submitted for the record. I'll Without give objection. A brief summary of my statement. Mr. Chairman, as the NRLCA's national president, it's in our members' best interest to work toward the creation of a financially stable postal service. Toward this end, our union has been working together with the Postal Service to establish revenue-generating programs along with ways to reduce costs for the Postal Service. One revenue-generating program we use is called Rural Reach. To date, the rural carrier craft has generated $26 million for the Postal Service, and we fully ex expect by the end of the first full year of existence to exceed $30 million in revenue for the Postal Service. Our union is the only union that can claim that actual employee wages, what our employees take home into his or her paycheck every two weeks, is in large measure based on mail volume. Every year rural routes are evaluated and rural carrier salaries are established based on the work performed each day during the evaluation. Mail volume is a critical factor in the salary setting process. During boom times for the Postal Service, rules carriers can see an increase in their route evaluations. Until recently, route evaluations generally went up due to increased mail volume, 
and an expanding customer base. Unfortunately, our last two mail counts resulted in significant reduction in rural route evaluation, impacting tens of thousands of rural letter carriers and causing their salaries to be lower. Last year, in a two-week mail count, rural routes served by our members lost anywhere from two to 12 hours of pay each week. Each evaluated hour is worth more than $1,500 per year, so you can see how declining mail volume dramatically affects the men and women we represent. This year, the NRLCA had a four-week mail count during the last two weeks in February, the first two weeks in March. Official results uh, from this recently completed mail count are not available. We are once again expecting rural route evaluations to go down, not up. The point I'm making is quite simple. Our people are hurting. They're making less money or in some cases opting to work an additional day to make the same amount of money. It's a, it is pretty simple. Reduction in rural route evaluations translate into direct savings to the Postal Service. If mail volumes decline, chances are very good that the Postal Service would be paying our members less because there will be less mail to deliver and collect each day. Never let it be said that rural carriers are not doing their part to help the company. We've been doing it for decades with our evaluated compensation system. If the business falters labor costs, at least rural letter carriers' labor costs are, are just adjusted downward. Every postal employee we represent knows in the pocketbook what it means for the company to be challenged by declining mail volume. The Postal Service can save literally hundreds of millions of dollars if of routes are evaluated when mail volume is low. But this annual adjustment mechanism does not stop with salaries. Most rural letter carriers still provide their own delivery vehicles from which they are paid an equipment maintenance allowance. EMA is adjusted quarterly by measuring fluctuations in CPIW, Transportation Index. In other words, EMA payments to rural carriers go down when costs, including the cost of fuel, go down. These regular adjustments have recently resulted in significant cost savings for the Postal Service as gasoline and automobile prices have dropped sharply. Our union, like the other postal unions during the last contract negotiation cycle, lost some ground on health benefit costs and now pay a larger percentage of health insurance premiums. Our members now pay more while the employer contribution to federal employee health benefit pre premiums as a percentage of total costs is lower. As health care costs for business and corporations continue to rise, our union members will pay an additional 4% of the federal employees health benefit programs over the life of the current collective bargaining agreement. It's another example of how our bargaining unit has provided additional savings to the Postal Service. The most important piece of legislation Congress should enact is H.R. 22, introduced by Representatives John McHugh and, and Danny Davis. The Postal Service is saddled with an ambitious payment schedule to pre-fund its retirees' health benefits. This is an obligation no other corporation or government agency is required to pre-fund. The last administration required this provision to be included for one simple purpose, to make the PAEA budget neutral. There are several other savings opportunities that the uh, Postal Service would have based on actions of Congress, including uh, helping them with the Medicare Part D, Recalculation, looking at the way that the FERS retirement is, system is set up and the payment that's made for uh, military retirees. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to testify before you today. I'd be happy to answer any additional questions you may have. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, appreciate your, your testimony. Let me ask, uh, there, has, there has been a menu of, of options that the uh, Postmaster General laid out uh, and uh, reinforced by the the Board of Governors, uh, Ms. Gallagher. They talked about vol a, a voluntary uh, separation program, voluntary retirement program. To my knowledge, at least the way they described it, it was not incentivized in any manner. Uh, I, th I can't remember the last time they did an incentivized retirement uh, program. 
might have been 1982, I think, when my mom retired. Uh, that's the last one I remember. But uh, there hasn't been a, a great groundswell of, of uh, you know, they're not beating the door down to get out of there. <laughs> uh, I, I question the, the efficacy of a program like that when the economy is so weak. You actually think people are going to go into retirement when they see their, you know, the 401K and their, their savings, uh, their investments, rather, uh, cut in half. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on on this uh, this effort uh, to to get 150,000 postal employees to take an early retirement? Um, speaking for the members of the American Postal Workers Union, they are not fools. They are not going to relinquish a job paying in excess of $50,000 a year to the uncertainty of a bad economic situation. Uh, it's an act of desperation. Uh, they are not going to have many takers, I predict. Uh, our union maintains that our collective bargaining agreement requires an incentive. Uh, we will resolve that through the grievance arbitration process. But uh, it's similar to the threat of five-day delivery. It's a diversion. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no intent, there's no desire, and there's certainly over Congress's congressional dead body that they'll get a five-day delivery. Uh, Mentioning those things sucks all the oxygen out of the discussion while we're uh, collectively fighting as hard as we can to get H.R. 22 passed. We really don't need these sideshows. So I'm yeah. very critical of them even bringing these things up. They are not the answer to the USPS problem. Uh, there are some long-term solutions, but the, the initial hurdle is the avoidance of that five-plus billion dollars obligation they have to the future retiree health benefits. Understood. That's loud and clear. Mr. Young, yeah. on, the, on the early retirement piece here, if I'm missing something. Excuse me, I couldn't hear you, sir. Uh, on the early retirement piece here, uh, do you think that's going to be successful the way they've got it framed right now? Uh, no, sir, I don't. Uh, in the last early retirement that was just offered to my members, less than 3,000 of them took it. Uh, it's the uncertainty. You, you said it exactly right. When people lost all their retirement savings, when the stock market plunged, they don't know what they're facing, what the future is going to look like, and there's a lot of uh, people out there that are scared. Yeah. I, I just I want to get back to this idea, these things that Potter and, and Gallagher brought to you this morning, and I just want to question in a general way, Mr. Lynch, whether it makes sense to try to make these kinds of decisions when the Postal Service is at the bottom. This would be like restructuring the Postal Service during the Great Depression. I, nobody that I talk to in this country believes we're going to be mired forever in the current economic state that we are. At least we all pray to God we're not. So mm. I think it makes a lot more sense to look at this when, when normalcy returns. Yeah. And I just make one thing. A lot of people are starting to believe now that all of a sudden the internet and these other uh, alternatives jumped into this. During the last six years, the Postal Service made all the right moves to protect themselves from that. And as one of the earlier speakers, one of the earlier panels testified, we'd have actually made $2.8 million last year if it hadn't been for this future retiree health benefit payment. Mm. So I think the real key is what you said. Let's find out what that real number is. What is the real number? What is that obligation? And then let's go from there in, in trying to decide how we make this the best postal service with the funds that we have available. Okay. Mr. Hegarty? Well, on, on the voluntary early retirement, on the voluntary early retirement, uh, I have a couple of concerns um, and, and something for the committee to consider too is employees hired since 1984 under the federal employees retirement system. If they take an early retirement, they lose the ability to contribute to the thrift savings plan. They lose the matching contributions. They don't qualify for Social Security right away. They really can't live on it. Uh, a, a, a typical uh, voluntary early retirement offer in the last round for an employee hired in uh, mid-1984 is $900 a month. Um, so I don't know uh, any postal employee, as, as uh, President Burris said, would go from a, a, a good-paying middle-class job uh, could live on $900 a month. For the civil service retirement employees, uh, the picture's a little bit better for them. They were all hired in 1983 or before. Some of them are approaching normal retirement age. But um, I'd love to see incentives. I just don't know where the money would come from for that either. Right. And, and the last time they did a, an incentive was 1992, and they lost so many employees in so many wrong places they had to hire to replace a lot of the employees that they uh, took the voluntary retirement. Right. Uh, I know I'm over my time, but I'm going to ask Mr. Cantrell, uh, President Cantrell, could you also hit that same question? Yeah, because we're the, 
the last mile of delivery, this is the first time we've ever been offered the voluntary early retirement. And uh, like the NALC, we had 606 carriers took advantage of voluntary early retirement. And the comments that I heard throughout the country was, if I'm going to have to work, I just as well work for the Postal Service because I cannot live on what I would be getting from my retirement without some sort of an incentive to do it. Yeah. And that was a general feeling from ours. I don't expect a large portion of our membership to take advantage of it this time. And in the positions, other than the declining mail volume, which may result in the loss of some, uh, some routes, if one of our people retires, someone has to replace them because we are that last mile, similar to the NALC. Someone is going to have to actually deliver that mail. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chaffetz for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and thanks to those of you that have been here since 930 in the morning. The chairman slipped me a note and said, don't worry, we're, we're halfway there. So um, <laughs> hang in there with us. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> uh, it, we, uh, we've heard various testimony, and, it, and the, the chorus has been uh, fairly united on the idea that uh, uh, support of HR 22. I personally support HR 22 now that I've been able to dive in and look at it. Um, and, and obviously, I think it has the numbers and the support uh, broad, uh, in a broad way, bipartisan way, and uh, hopefully we can get to that sooner rather than later. Um, uh, we need revenues to go up. We need expenses to go down to get to that magical point. We have to deal with the fact, the realities of where things are today. So I guess I'd like to leave with a sense of what are the top three things we can do to affect either revenues going up and or expenses going down. HR 22 plays a critical and important role and gets us a long ways towards that, uh, that direction. Taking maybe 30 seconds each, knowing that you'll each take a minute, uh, maybe you could, uh, we could start with uh, uh, President Cantrell there and, and give me a sense of what you would add to that list. We need big things that are going to make big differences. What are kind of numbers two and three on that list that you would add? I guess I would have to piggyback a little bit on what you heard from the managers. Mm -hmm. We see so many levels out there, and I'm going to use my postmaster I just talked to within the last week when he told me what my evaluation was. He said, I'm so tired of filling out a report verifying that I filled out the reports that had to be reported <laughs> and not given the opportunity to run my office. One of his comments was, I know less about running my office now than I did 15 years ago when I got the position. So I think there has to be some streamlining in middle, middle management and put some responsibility back on those postmasters to make those decisions. I think Charlie and, and Dale both said it very well. They're very capable of making the decisions that need to be made there. They don't need three levels of middle management to tell them what they need to do. Uh, I think we're uh, top heavy in a lot of areas. I don't see that we need 80 or 74 districts. I don't think we need 10 areas to tell us, uh, our members, how to deliver the mail. We've got too many people that are not actually handling the mail telling people that are handling the mail what they need to do and how they need to do it. Thank you. Mr. Hager, President Hager. Thank you. Um, the first thing I think uh, we need to do is continue the revenue generation that, that the uh, unions are participating in. The carriers and, and rural carriers have done it for a number of years. We just started uh, last year uh, talking to vendors, people we do business with that don't use the U.S. mail. We now have the opportunity to fill out a form or go on the computer and a, a professional postal service sales associate will call on that business and explain to them the benefits of the mail, how they can get better service, how they can save money. So that's just taking off from my craft's perspective. But as I said, the letter carriers in the rurals have been doing it for quite a while. Uh, one thing I would uh, caution that you should do is not go to five-day delivery. And, and that would be in the top three for me. Um, the, one of the reasons we've talked about uh, driving people to our competitors, the other thing I, I think that would do is drive people to the Internet because the first time their bank statement doesn't come on time or the first time their credit card bill goes late, they're going to say, the heck with this, I can go online, do all that stuff, and save myself some postage. So, Thank you. Uh, President, yeah? Yes. I'm just going to give you the list. First and foremost, restore the economy. When, okay. that, when that's done, the Postal Service is fine. If you can get me till Thursday. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I thought I was just going to say, you're from Utah. You can do that by Thursday. Oh, man. yeah, Utah. Second, 
the Medicare subsidy Part B, Part D. Mm -hmm. That was designed for companies to provide a drug benefit equal to Medicare. We do, and just with the stroke of a pen, the previous president said, "We're not going to give it to you." Notwithstanding the fact that's about eight billion right there. Eight billion is what I'm told the number is there. Management restructuring would be number three, and here's number four for you. We are still paying for FERS employees for the time they spent in military service. In the Postal Reorganization Act that we just passed in 2006, we took care of the CSRS employees, their previous military service. That was $17 billion. That was the, the, the cost of that. We are still asking mailers and the people that pay postage to pay for the time that anybody who's a FERS employee after 1984, mm -hmm. any time they spent in the military. That would be significant Thank as you. well. Thank you. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Number one is <clears> H.R. <throat> 22. Mm -hmm. Number two is restoring the economy. Number three to infinity is similar to jumping off a five-story building and flapping your arms. It doesn't cushion the far but it gives you something to do on the way down. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank okay. you all. Thank you. Uh, let me ask, the, one of the other uh, legs of the stool that, that uh, Postmaster General Potter had, had thrown out there was consolidation of some of these uh, post offices. Uh, they've already gone with six facilities, six area facilities, which I guess are largely for administrative purposes, but uh, there's a sense that uh, there could be some consolidation of, of more of the urban uh, post offices and uh, while that might not necessarily affect the number of people out there uh, in terms of your workers, uh, it, it may, we may gain some efficiencies by, you know, discontinuing leases that we have out there or, or closing down some facilities that are that are obsolete or are not being u not being utilized uh, to to a full extent. What are your thoughts on on that idea about closing those facilities? In general, we oppose consolidations. We support efficiencies. If the post service can uh, prove to the community that a consolidation is the interest of saving the post service money while providing the same level of service to the citizens of that community, then we stand aside and will support such an effort. But what we see in the current plan is deny the, the single user, my grandmother, my cousin, the student in college, to deny them the level of service they provide for the major mailers. Major mailers follow the posters, and it's actually beneficial to them because it reduces the number of drop points where they take their mail to. So consolidation saves money for your major printers and major mailers. But uh, it's, it's creating a... a a two-tier United States Post Service. One system for the major mailers, a totally different system for the person that drops the letter in the collection box at the end of the corner. That's the danger of this consolidation plan. It's not just efficiency. It's separating the posters into one post service for the haves, another post service for the have-nots, and we oppose that. Okay, Mr. Young. I think it's worth a look, but I caution, and I think you know this, so I know you do, sir, because of your background, but it's going to be real heavy on all of you. Every time we try to close any facility in your areas, you're going to hear from all of the people that, you, that live in that area, so the millions of reasons as to why it happened, shouldn't happen. I just make this one remark, and, and, and you just take it for what it's worth. I believe this is the right number. If it's not, I apologize, but it's close. Long Island has 80 postmasters. And ask yourself the question, do you think that's necessary? Mm. It's not that big of an island. All right. President Hegarty. Well, again, if, if it makes sense, if it's going to save the Postal Service money, but the key is if it's not going to hurt service, then uh, we are not opposed to it, provided it's done in accordance with our collective bargaining agreement and the Postal Service's own handbooks and manuals. They have a handbook called the Handbook PO408, it governs their area mail processing surveys where they're supposed to do a survey. And under the PAEA, they have to have community input, stakeholder input, and hold a public hearing. One quick example, they're doing an AMP study right now in my home facility of Springfield, Massachusetts, and they want to truck all of the cancellation mail, the letters that come in that need to be run on the cancellation machines, down to Hartford, Connecticut to be canceled and then truck them back up to Springfield to be delivered. Uh, I know you're familiar with the state of Massachusetts, Springfield to Hartford's about 35 miles. It's down I-91. They'd be going down there in rush hour traffic, uh, all kinds of weather. 
it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So those are the types of uh, consolidations that we're opposed to. Yeah. Now, Mr. Cantrell, I know that uh, you represent the rural uh, carriers, so uh, you're probably outside of, uh, you know, the possibility of consolidation in many cases. But uh, your, your thoughts? Well, we do have some in, some in urban areas, but, yeah, I do deal mostly with the rural areas, and there's a real identity problem there. They, they do not like losing that. <laughs> Uh, there's there's solutions that can be there. There's things that can be done uh, to look at to make sure that the communities are provided the same service that they have. Uh, in my area, there's three or four small offices that in one post office, three or four clerks could provide the same uh, amount of hours at the window and do the same amount of service without uh, having a, a manager there all day long. Uh, and still provide the service that we need in those rural communities. I, I don't look much toward closing a lot of those down because of uh, the identity for that community and, and what goes on there. So it, it's a little more difficult for me to, to jump on board of closing down very many offices. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, I, I don't believe we have any more uh, questions, but I do have a comment, and that is that uh, the Postal Service is, is one of the most respected uh, government institutions in this country because of what the people you represent every day uh, do in, in our communities, whether they are rural communities. Uh, you know, po folks have a, a great deal of respect for their local letter carrier in the cities as well as the suburbs, their local clerk is a very familiar face around town. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really that reputation of reliability and of, of, of great service is largely due to the people that you represent. So we, we thank you for that. And uh, just as I spoke earlier with the supervisors and, and, and postmasters that we have an open process here on how to proceed, uh, I, I do want to caution that time is a wasting and uh, we don't have a lot of options here. We don't have a lot of time, let me put it that way. So we're going to have to decide on a course of action and we're going to have to get to it. Uh, sounds like uh, HR 22 in some iteration will, will be part of that approach and that response. Uh, but we would like to do more than just that. And, and we would welcome your, your input, your ideas. You see it at a ground level uh, and you've seen it for a, a good while. And so we would be enriched by having your input in this whole process. We welcome it. Uh, I thank you for your testimony here, and uh, you have a good day. <laughs>